Welcome to another episode of the Big Picture of Business podcast. And today we have another very exciting guest for all of you. Tatiana Sawyer is here with us today. Hi, Tatiana. Hi. <laughs> Tatiana is an author, podcaster, and business owner. Tatiana is a CPA and founder of Linza Advisors. And that's actually much more than an accountant. She's a numbers expert with over 15 years of experience helping entrepreneurs and business owners become the boss of their bottom line. I love that. Tatiana is now committed to sharing her expertise with a broader audience to empower those overwhelmed and confused with running a business so they can make money doing what they love. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> to all of that. <laughs> so happy you are here. For those of you watching, I just have to mention this. Tatiana has an incredible, is it a poster? I don't know what is behind you there, but it says, never underestimate the power of a girl <laughs> with a book. What? <laughs> That's amazing. All of us being authors, that is very true and profound that I love seeing that on your wall. I've got to ask, how did you get started with numbers? Like, take me back. Like, how did the the (laughs) passion for numbers happen? Well, I was kind of always good at math. But at the same time, when I came to the United States, I'm not originally, I wasn't originally born here. So when I came to the United States, I actually um, wanted to be a lawyer. I went to law school back in in Russia. And for two years, it's a five-year undergraduate slash graduate program. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was 14. It was my big passion, but I was also good at math at the same time. So um, I came to the U.S. and in the U.S. it's a graduate program. So I figured, you know what, I need to pick a major in college for my bachelor's to finish my bachelor's so that I can have a skill and I can put myself through college because I was by myself here and through law school. So as I was studying for accounting, our college wasn't really known for accounting. It was actually n- known for nursing school. So when, as I was studying accounting, our department kind of brainwashed us. And, you know, every, like almost every lesson, every class, they would say, you know, since you're accounting majors, you might as well sit for the CPA exam. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should. Uh, <laughs> so because I was also at the same time working with small businesses, I was doing bookkeeping to kind of put myself through college, support myself. I actually got to learn the stuff in class and apply it next day at work. Cool. So for, for me, it was kind of the, oh, oh, this is what that means in real life. And it was an immediate connection. So because I was, you know, in, in with working with small businesses, I've worked with several of them at, at the same time because um, they're small businesses that so they didn't really need a bookkeeper full time. They needed someone for a day a week or two days a week. So for me, kind of numbers came alive when, when I was doing that. And that's slowly how I fell in love with numbers and taxes. And I never thought that I would be a tax geek, but here we are. Um, (laughs) But also at the same time, I feel like I've seen our industry enough to, to realize that most accountants don't really understand their clients as much. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the, you know, the book was kind of um, a way of supporting People who have a dream of a business, people who want to start something that's meaningful to them, supporting them from, uh, from a point of their probably their weakest point, I guess, uh, is the word I'm looking for. So money, numbers, and taxes is typically not natural for, for most people, except for maybe accountants. But, uh, and that's normal. That's, you know, music is not natural to me necessarily, although I play the guitar without knowing a single note. So it's, it's just interesting how life kind of turns in different directions. And for me, it's definitely been um, an interesting journey and something that I would have never expected before, <laughs> before I got on it. Interesting. You make a, a very, very valid point where, yes, anyone can sort of start a business, but they don't know about the numbers necessarily. They just kind of have the idea behind them about what they want to do or not do just whatever it's going to transform into, you know? And that's something that I, I'm constantly saying to my clients, Rory knows this. I say, please understand your numbers. Look at the P and L look at the balance sheet. Let's see what things are looking like every month, every quarter. It's important to at least get a baseline, like a basic education. You wrote a book, right? Dream bold, start smart. Love it. 
So this book specifically is not for my clients. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I've kind of been in accounting field for 16 years and the first eight or so were in bookkeeping. So I'm a really good bookkeeper. And, you know, I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with bookkeeping for a number of years, you know, because at one, once I became an accountant, I was like, bookkeeping is, you know, not for me. I'm too, I'm too smart for that. <laughs> but then I realized as I got more into tax and more into advisory specifically, I realized that how important bookkeeping is and that good, timely and well done bookkeeping is the cornerstone of a business because that's what a business owner can use to make decisions. I mean, I've met a couple of clients along the way who were as far away from accounting as humanly possible when they first started, but they've also forced themselves to learn and understand their cash flow, their numbers, their taxes. They're not accountants. They don't understand. They, I lose them when I start talking in, in geek language and things like that, but mm -hmm. most importantly, they understand what to look for and they understand the questions to ask mm -hmm. and the decisions that have to be made. An example of that could be, uh, I've noticed, let's say today, when I spoke to a client where I noticed that has been, he's been, his system has been under collecting sales tax. So his questions were, how can we rectify the situation? situation? What should we do? What's the first step? Hmm. That's an experienced business owner. And um, there is a difference between someone who's just running a business as a hobby when they don't really pay attention to the numbers, they don't really want to understand taxes, they don't even try. And someone who's a true CEO of a business. And we're not talking about, you know, billion dollar companies. We're talking about mom and pop shops. You can still be the CEO of your business if you want to, if you do it right. Hmm. Very, very well said. All right. So I think we have two paths that we need to address then. Right? <laughs> Questioning mm -hmm. here. We need to address the people who are just getting started and best practices, right? And then people who are already doing well in their business, but maybe aren't paying attention to the numbers. So let's first start. If someone is looking to just get started with their business, what's the best practices that they can put into place that is going to really help them get their numbers straight from the very beginning? So I realized as you were talking that I didn't really specifically answer your question. So <laughs> I'm going to come back to that for a second. Okay. Um, so the reason I wrote the book is because for the past three years, I have really stopped working with startups. Um, typically, there's no budget for someone like me. And, and honestly, often there is no need for someone like me. But there are some basics that um, every person who's starting out needs to get right. And some people go um, manage their business for years before they actually get those basics done right, which is, which is what prompted me to write this book. I wanted to create something that is a roadmap for someone who has a business idea or wants to maybe leave their nine to five job and, and be on their own, but they don't know where to start and get overwhelmed, maybe anxious about having to hire an accountant. That usually means a lot of money. I also, you know, give, um, and there's an appendix where I talk about when to hire an accountant and what kind and what to look for and what questions to ask. So, um, it doesn't have to be someone expensive. It doesn't have to be an attorney, but you do have to know your numbers. You do need to understand what your business model is like. This book, it was created for, not for my current clients, but for all of the people who have a dream to allow them to make that dream a reality without making mistakes that I've seen most often made in my practice. Typically, by the time people get to me, they've already learned their lessons and wasted some time, wasted money maybe some um, hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, that's the truth. That's the reality of it. So I wanted to create some, something so that people can have a roadmap and start their business better because the stronger they are, the stronger we all are. Absolutely. I appreciate your authenticity when you say, you know, someone like me, like I'm not the right person for startups anymore. You know, I'm, I'm at yeah. this level where I, I'm better suited. So that's, that's a very, very important point that you're bringing up. And I think a lot of people are trying to navigate that with their business all the time. It's like, where's that line? Like, am I going to work with startups, especially for consultants, right? Work with startups, work with higher level, C-level executives. What does that look like? So again, that's I just right. appreciate your, your authenticity about that. What's, and what's it's that very mean? important to be clear. And I, 
And I think it's a good example of how you are being clear, but you're also serving the market. It's the same reason why I make books about how to make books, because that's my, my industry, right? So the books that I make about how to, how to create a book are there to serve people and teach them how to do a book that's going to help grow their business. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily ready for to work in my agency. Those are people who are already established business owners. Very similar to my, my logic. I wanted to help someone to get started right so that at, this, at some point they can get someone like me and skip the, all of the stuff that they don't need to, to do, skip the mistakes, skip the money waste, and know exactly the direction, address it early, face it early, um, and, and really take reins in their own hands. Yeah. So Rory, back to your question, because I'm curious now. So you, you were talking about the two different sides, right? And your well, question was around. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, I think your, your book is the solution, right? For yeah. anyone who's looking anyone. to understand their numbers, then they should just get your book, right? And then yeah. getting started, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, <cool> that. <laughs> so, right? so understanding the numbers is a concept that <laughs> is kind of vague. It is. And, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can explain it better then. <laughs> so the book is is actually consists of two parts. Dream bold part. I talk about things like, are you sure what your business model is about? And I'm not a marketing person, actually, as far away from marketing as I can be. But do you understand why people will buy from you, and what exactly will they buy, and why would they pay you? I've had people come to me and ask me, oh, we have this idea, you know, everyone wanted to be the next Facebook. So um, I have this idea for the platform to connect this person and this person. And I'm like, who's going to pay your fee? Like, are you going to do it for free? And they couldn't answer. So that's the first step in, in that direction. So it's, it's pure math. How much do you need to sell every month in order to pay whatever expenses you have? The next one of the next one of the my favorite chapters is actually a chapter of, uh, on partnerships. <laughs> um, this chapter used to be called uh, "Partnerships Never Work," hmm. uh, <laughs> but then I changed the cha- title. The editor changed the title a little bit, so now the the um, the chapter is called "Should You Have a Partner?" And in most cases, you know, based on my experience, what I've seen, uh, partnerships rarely work. True partnerships where you know, we're not talking about partnerships where there's a limited partner, just kind of an investor type, putting money in and not really participating. We're talking about two active partners. Um, it rarely works. And it, so typically I, I, ga- I give readers um, a couple of stories, client stories on that, but also say that if you do decide that partnership is right for you, cover some basics, make sure that you have an agreement Make sure you under, you kind of have the worst case scenario, best case scenario, and all of the above. Make sure that you know the other person because my client used to say uh, <laughs> that partnership is like marriage just without the benefits. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so kind of the cut to cover those basics. Investors, should you have investors? And I go through a couple of basic points that to allow people to understand whether or not they want investor capital, to understand the difference between a venture capitalist um, and um, an angel investor, for example. Hmm. And some people, actually a client of mine, and I share the story in the book, a client of mine said, I interviewed him for, for, this, for this chapter. Um, he said that he thinks everyone should have an investor. And I thought, really? Um, and he explained that when you try to sell your idea and you have one person, better two people, write you a check, that means it's a good idea. So a couple of those basics are in the first part of the book. The second part of the book is Start Smart. We talk about what entity is best for you to start with, um, what, um, how to price your product or service using price psychology, how to be a cash flow guru of your business. I have, like I said, clients who are far away from accounting have become cash management kings. It's, it's really fascinating to see, mm. um, to watch, I guess, uh, is the right term. And also how to set up for lower taxes. So US tax code specifically is geared towards small businesses, mom and pop shops. And because of that, there are a lot of hidden uh, benefits in the revenue code. So if you understand how to make things 
ordinary things deductible or indirectly deductible, you will set yourself up for lower taxes. That component is not a one-time event once the year is over. Once the year is over, it's done. You, there's nothing you can do. You can maybe defer some tax if you put it into retirement and things like that, but their proactive strategies have to be implemented throughout the year. And that's kind of why, like I said, I no longer work with startups. I work with businesses that can um, afford and also need this guidance throughout the year, mm -hmm. tax saving guidance. Could you give us, not to, <laughs> not to give away anything in the book necessarily, but can you give us like the top two proactive tax reduction tips? So if you have children, you can hire kids, but so there's something called a kiddie tax. Kiddie tax is, is basically taxing kids' income at the parents' rate. There used to be a time when parents would shift investment money to kids' accounts um, and kids would pay lower tax because kid, the parents, let's say, were at the top tax bracket. Then the government created kiddie tax, which means if the child is under a certain age um, and it's investment income, they pay parents' rate, basically. Now it's actually even worse. I think it's a flat 40% rate or something to that nature. By shifting some income, and it has to be for real work, you have to have time sheets, you have to have job descriptions. It doesn't have to be weekly, but it can be monthly or quarterly work. But if you pay your under um, age children, so minor children, a certain way, you can actually not only save the difference, you know, 35%, let's say 37% top rate and zero, you could also save the self-employment tax under age, the age of 18. So that could be savings of at the top parent rate of 50%, just on the federal level, not even considering state. Hiring kids is important, but there are certain age limits that have gone through tax court and kind of have been frowned upon. So uh, let's say the, the minimum age is seven. Once you have kids over seven, you can do that. Then there is, you know, for your kids, if you want to put some money away for their education, most people do 529 plans, but most accountants actually don't like 529 plans, educational plans, because um, in order to make a decent return on it, you have to put a lot of money at once. And that kind of kills the purpose of the 529 plan because you get a deduction only for a small portion of it. So for that, you can use a, a Roth IRA, a custodial Roth. Um, if you pay your child, your child has earned income, you put that money into custodial Roth. When the child turns 18, they get this account. However, they can't withdraw from it unless it's for education, medical, or, uh, or first-time home buyer. So not only you become a super parent, you also set up your kid with some nice money that they can't really spend on what they want because they'll pay a penalty <laughs> on it. <laughs> uh-huh. It's brilliant. Yeah. And, and the, the earliest age that you can set up a custodial Roth, you said it was seven, the age of seven? Uh, seven is the age when you can have kids on payroll. <laughs> Got it. Okay. But, but if I, like, for example, I have a three-year-old. So if I wanted to set her up on a custodial Roth, I could do that now? So under seven, it's really, so in order to have a custodial Roth IRA account, you have to have earned income. So you have to have payment for services. Okay. So then, right. So she's got to be an employee at seven <laughs> first to roll it in. Got it. Yeah. Correct. So I've, I mean, I've done it for a few clients and certainly for my own kids. Um, I've issued the 1099 one year for modeling to set a, the account up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a five-year rule in Roth IRA accounts. So I set up um, an account so that the five-year clock starts running, but you can, you know, you can have the model for your business. You can, you know, have them take pictures, put pictures on your website, that kind of stuff. And that can fly for a year or two. <laughs> I was, I was thinking about that with my daughter. Cause she, she is like, you know, she's in a lot of my, my marketing images I'm like that would work. Right. <laughs> I mean, she's, sure. she's technically a model. She's helping bring more money into the business. Yeah. Sure. Gotta wait till she's seven though. <laughs> Crap. Okay, we've got no, one. you can do you can do the model before seven. That's what I was saying. Oh, okay, and 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 that will fly <laughs> for a couple of years. I see what you're saying. Nice, <laughs> excellent tip. Right. She's gonna get 10.99 today. <laughs> Does she have to sign it? Do I have to like put it in her hand and? <laughs> no, but um, uh, <laughs> but you you might get a letter from the IRS, which is what I got. Um. Uh, where we think that there's a mistake, da da da, and you just bring them a 1099 and you show it to them, say that she's a model, and that's it. Okay, done. <laughs> Actually, not not the IRS, Social Security Administration is the the okay. agency that does that. 
Okay. <laughs> Fantastic information. Yeah. Okay. So that's one super, super solid for all of you listening. Make sure you put your kids on payroll. <laughs> 1099 them. Get them, <laughs> get them going. Make them a contractor. Um, what would you say is the second, the, the second uh, <laughs> tip? Another thing that I see personally uh, missed a lot of times is the HSA, HSA. It's the health savings account. A lot of folks have high deductible health plans. So a high deductible plan has a um, deductible, annual deductible out of pocket of at least $1,400, about $1,400. It changes every year for a single person or $2,800 for a family. If you have a deductible that's higher than that, which is basically the majority of people, you can put away money in an HSA account. And the beauty of an HSA account is actually one of my favorites. It's just too bad that the balance is so low for you to contribute, but it's you get a deduction when you put money in. It grows tax-free. If you take it out for medical expenses, it's never taxed. Mm-hmm. And so, yet so many people pay out-of-pocket costs. Um, I had a client, potential client recently, and he had $12,000 of medical expenses on, on a Schedule A. And I'm like, why didn't you do an HSA? Because when you have medical expenses and you don't have an HSA, you basically lose the deduction. Mm-hmm. Usually most people have like a very, so medical expenses have a pretty high floor and up to that floor. So let's say you had $15,000 in medical expenses. The floor is 7,500. Only the second 7,500 is deductible. The first, you just lose the deduction for it. But with the HSA, <laughs> with the HSA, you just pay with a card with the HSA card for prescriptions, mm-hmm. for doctor visits, dentists, um, and things like that, medical medical stuff, and you basically get a deduction. You just prepay it, um, mm-hmm. in the, you know, and you can put away anywhere from for a single person thirty five hundred about, for a family seventy nine hundred or seventy one hundred or something like that. It changes every year. It gets adjusted for inflation. Yeah, but it's pretty powerful. And I see it missed pretty much on every return that I see (laughs) that comes to me. I feel really silly. My husband and I only really got educated about the HSA two years ago. So we're still relatively new to it. But the fact that we've done it and like seen the difference of where we were before, it's like, this is awesome. Yeah, that's that's definitely the way to go. Now, banks banks don't like to administer HSAs because they don't really make money on, on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually recommend like online um, HSA banks, they send you a debit card and basically you just use that debit card. You can see your expenses, you can print it out, save it for your taxes so that if you ever get audited, you have proof of your expenses and they also allow you to invest that money, which is phenomenal, I think. Totally. Hundred percent. I love this. Geek it out. <laughs> this is so such fun. Good info. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're just a wealth, <laughs> really fantastic. You're gonna save thousands of people thousands of dollars. <laughs> this is fantastic. I want to ask you um, a question about about numbers, but getting away a little bit from taxes, okay? Because we've really dived into taxes and help people <laughs> out here. What strategies for calculating like what a business owner should charge for a product or service would you recommend? That's a topic in and of itself. It's a very rich topic. There are books on price psychology and price psychology in general is a study of how people make buying decisions just based on price. So people make buying decisions, not just based on price, but price psychology specifically studies how people make these decisions by looking at a price or hearing a price or whatever. And the basic concept of price psychology is the bigger the price is visually, lengthwise, if you have to say it and it's longer, the higher our brains perceives the price to be. Which I can illustrate by, you know, if you go to a fine dining, dining restaurant, the price is never a big number. It often doesn't even have a dollar sign next to it. It's kind of listed matter of factly after the dish description. And, and so that by the time you get to the price, your mouth waters and you don't care. Mm. Yeah. And it's usually, it'll usually be like 83 or whatever. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's really simple. Yeah. No dollar signs. No I've even, decimals. I've even, yeah. No decimals. Yeah. yeah. I've even, uh, I've even, split tested that in marketing large packages as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very interesting how it plays out. Yeah. And if you think about it, if someone says, well, 
my coaching package is eight eight thousand dollars versus my coaching package is eight k. Mm-hmm. Your brain thinks, oh, eight k, I can do that. That interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, some people use, I mean, some companies, I guess, use price psychology to deceive pe- other people, their customers. But if used right, what it actually does is not deceive, but create an equation, I guess, in your brain where you value or weigh the um, value that you get versus the price. And it's an equal, it, you're comparing apples to apples. You're, you're, you realize that you're getting a good deal. So um, that's just the very basic concept of price psychology. Um, a lot of delis in New York City, especially, like they use $19.99 for a sandwich. That price seems high. If you just make it 20 bucks or make it 19, but don't get those decimals in and don't underline, you know, like how a lot of menus under underscore with the little dots Mm -hmm. that also you're connecting the dish to the price. Mm -hmm. If you want to have, you know, higher revenue, don't do that. (laughs) You know, there are also the menu pricing. There's also a menu pricing approach that is typically applied to service businesses. But I actually noticed I (laughs) gave a presentation on price psychology at a college and for MBA students. What was interesting is that at the time, I think it was two, three years ago, Apple had on their iMac um, page, they would have two iMacs, the 24 inch and the 27 inch. So two, um, two products. And I used to say that, you know, it's really hard to apply menu pricing to a product business, but actually since then Apple has changed their website and I'll talk about this in a second. And now they have three products on their website. So menu pricing is a tiered pricing. It's essentially um, called price discrimination. The reason for it and the reason that every business should have a menu price, um, menu price structure rather, is that there will always be people who will want the all-inclusive resort. Hmm. There will always be people who will want the cheapest one because they want to work with you, but they still can't afford even your middle package. 60% of people will buy your middle package statistically. So if you offer only one, one type of service, like accountants, you know, I'm, I'm not that accountant, but most accountants offer this one price, tax return preparation. Well, tax return preparation service is plugging numbers into the tax return and essentially compiling work papers so that if the accountant gets audited, they don't go to jail. Uh, that's essentially what the service is. But think about this. Uh, so small businesses often need a lot more than that. They need support. They need to make sure that their accountant, their advisor is on their side. And also they can really rely on that person. So when, you know, when you, I thought that it cannot be applied, menu pricing cannot be applied to accounting, but it can be applied to any service business. And Apple has proven that it can be applied to a product business just as well. Typically, like I said, 60% of people will buy a middle package. What does that tell you? it tells you that you have to make sure that there's enough value in that package and also that you price it with your target profit in mind because you're going to be mostly selling that package. But there will also be people who, like I said, won't be able to afford a middle package, but they would want to work with you, with your brand. And so you don't want to turn them away. So when they, you have to create an entry point that also makes sense for you. And I'll give you an example in my business kind of so that it's a little bit more alive. So I I usually give this example. I say that uh, your top package is the all-inclusive resort. Your middle package is a really good hotel on the beach. Your lowest package is a hostel, (laughs) basically. (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're willing to sell that lower package. I used to have a lower package of just the tax preparation. And I used to tell potential clients, you know, I don't offer that anymore. (laughs) And then I started thinking like, why do I even have it on my menu pricing if I don't offer it? So I redesigned my packages a little bit. And now my lowest uh, service is you get a tax plan. When you connect with me, we we look at your personal situation, we look at your business and we come up with strategies to save you money on tax year after year. Some savings will be just one year, some savings will, will, be, will be ongoing. And then we maintain this plan and prepare your taxes for you. The maintenance of the plan includes meeting with you, reviewing if anything has changed, if any paperwork needs to be put in the file in case of an audit. 
and making sure that you've paid you know your enough tax and things like that. So and plus it includes preparation. So my lowest service is that. My top service includes everything, priority service, weekends, um, and also an important point is audit representation. So typically if you get audited, you have to pay someone to represent you and you should pay someone to represent you because if you go there alone, you don't have the buffer to say, oh, I'll have to check with my client and get back to you. So an audit can cost anywhere from 5,000 to 15 grand for, for the entire process. So my top package, my all-inclusive resort has that um, insurance. If a client gets audited, I represent them and they don't pay a penny. That's an amazing, amazing offer. Oh my gosh. You guys, are you <laughs> hearing this right now? Like she said, this is insurance. That sounds incredible. Wow. Yeah. This is what I talk about rev offers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Relevant, enticing, and very low risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's an example of a rev offer. <laughs> and you will sleep so much better at night yeah. <laughs> knowing that you have that security. Wow. It's like the ultimate gift. Yeah. Because this is the big picture business podcast, I also want to pull this out and look at the bigger picture, right? Okay. So you've got your service business, which has three packages, right? But then your service business is one aspect, but now you have a book, right? <laughs> yep. So what's your middle tier between your book and your service business? So um, I actually have three businesses at the moment. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have a book that I'm promoting and um, educating and want people. I, don't want, I want my book to change people's lives. I think it can. Changing my <laughs> life, just sitting here learning about it. So yeah, this is great. You know, I saw that people, that accountants are not really doing great service to small businesses. The reason is, I think that technological progress has pushed us into this rat race of getting more clients and not really charging for everything that we do. Because of that, accountants get like three, 400 clients. And imagine having that many clients. I think the average um, in the country is like 700. Uh, imagine having that many clients. You don't have time to meet with people to learn about their families, about whom they're supporting, what their goals are, what they want to do. So basically what happens is that the client goes through life thinking that they have this accountant and then they either get you know audited or they just don't lose money in their business or whatever. And uh, the bottom line is the reason that I'm saying this is that knowing what to look for, knowing what to ask for and being, being willing to really take your business to the next level can make all the difference. And kind of coming back to your, to your question, I think that it's, it's really critical for everyone, like everyone who's listening to look at the big picture, but also don't forget that you are the one who cares about your business more than anyone else. I tell, I keep telling my clients, I have a couple of CFO clients who, you know, for whom we do CFO work. So I still make them pay their own bills. The reason is I want them to know when cash is leaving the bank. And when they do know, they're like, oh, there's health insurance coming out. Okay, uh, I need to make sure I have enough cash in the bank. So when you think about it, my middle is really everything that I do. So I think the book is actually my serving the people who can't afford my service, right? Mm -hmm. My uh, Linza Advisors, my, my firm is for people who want a service. And then somewhere in the middle, I think, although I don't look at it that way, but somewhere in the middle is my... Um, coaching and course business. So I've launched a couple of educational courses just based on the need that I've seen. Um, I educate women to become bookkeepers that I would hire in my firm, for example, and other accountants would hire. So um, I think that it's, and I also coach, I found that I have a gift of coaching um, just by saying, oh, you know, you should try this. Um, you should, you know, if you like flowers, okay, you can do this, this, and this with that. And people love that. I've had people come back to me years after and say, you know, that thing you said to me that time, I did it. And now I'm working for this firm and I'm really happy. I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> uh, that's the thing that I enjoy. And I actually enjoy all, all of my businesses because I, I, 
just love what I do. But when you get people's response, when you get your readers' response, and when they say, you know, this is the book, I'm so happy that I came across this book, or I'm so happy that I came across your, you know, your podcast or your um, teaching, that just makes it all worthwhile, all the hard work, all the sleepless nights. <laughs> Could not have said it any better. Yeah. This, this is the model that I teach. So that's why I wanted to point that out mm -hmm. because when you have a book, you have programs that you can monetize without you having to be running, you know, doing it in the business every day. But then you have your higher ticket exclusive services where you're getting paid well to do them. You have a fully functioning business. Yeah. This is what an <laughs> online business looks like these days. So I'm That's so glad that you are doing it. I don't know, you know, maybe you figured this out on your own or you, you know, have learned parts of it or, you know, from people, <laughs> but I'm just glad that you're actually doing it because so few people can put those puzzle pieces together mm -hmm. and go, this is what a business looks like. And when you have it, I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's such a, it's such a nice feeling, isn't it? When you're like, yeah. oh, this, this is how things should be. Yeah. I have to say to your credit, I've never met another entrepreneur, a business owner that had that mind, same mindset that Rory and I do. That's why we called this podcast, the big picture business podcast, because Rory and I have this ability to just like pick out things and go, okay, this, 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 this here, here's the strategy. Here's the plan. We see it. Let's, let's, you know, run with it. And you have that too. It's a very, it's a very unique gift. So it's, it's nice to speak with, uh, with like-minded, uh, like-minded entrepreneur like yourself. It's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you are just lovely. This has been yeah. so much fun. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share these incredibly valuable tips. And for everyone listening and watching, you've got to go pick up her book. I'm going to go do it right now because I still have a lot to learn. It's incredible. Dream bold, start smart. And you also have a special offer for our listeners. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, the offer is so I developed a little checklist. And this checklist can apply to uh, someone who's just starting out or wants to start something or someone who's been at it for a few years. And so, so does the book. The book will kind of also give you checkpoints for every, everything that you need to cover. But the checklist is kind of like a scored checklist. So for every check mark, you get one point. And then you total it up and you look at it, um, basically covering some of the foundational items that I think every business should have talking about price psychology, talking about cash flow and everything in between. And also the checklist is split in like six parts and the videos that come with it, that's a special offer because it was only exclusively available to people who pre-ordered the book. So I make this available for a listener, for your listeners. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> um, so I basically have also a series of a few videos where I explain each of the six um, sides and give you examples and kind of give you food for thought. Awesome. What an incredible gift. We will be sure to have a link specific for that offer in our show notes. Again, thank you so much for taking the time with us. That is it for this week. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.